Hello friends, welcome back to the channel. I'm Dave from Chase to Summit and today we're gonna to be talking about VO2 max and how a lab test like the gold standard compares to all the wearables out there. I've, I've got a few of them, as you know. You see, about a year ago, I posted a very similar video to this one where I went and did a VO2 max lab test and compared it to all the wearables I had at that time. Unfortunately, I made a mistake in that video as that lab test was done on an assault bike and I'm mainly a runner. And a lot of you pointed that out to me in the comments where I should have been running on a treadmill for this test. So we're back to do it all over again. And this time I crossed the T's and dotted the I's to try to get you the most accurate information possible when it comes to estimated VO2 max on your wearable. In this video today, I'm gonna to be sharing my recent experience and results from a VO2 max lab test I did a couple of weeks ago at a highly reputable facility here in the Boston area called Human Powered Health. They're not sponsoring this video or anything, but I do wanna give them a big shout out for letting me borrow the lab for the day. It was quite useful even though there was a lot of suffering that happened. All right, we're gonna drive. Good push. We're gonna take the results I got from that lab test and compare it to all the wearables I've been wearing for the past couple of years. That's gonna be devices like the Garmin Phoenix 8 I have here, the Tactics 8, the Coros Pace Pro, we've got the Sunto Race S here, and the Polar Grit X2 Pro. But we also can't forget the Apple Watches. You gotta include those in this video as well. I'll also be comparing those results to other non-watch things like the Ultra Human Ring Air I have here because that gets pretty interesting. And the whole purpose behind this video is that all of these different devices I have here use different algorithms and methods for determining your VO2 max. At this point of the video, if you don't know what VO2 max is, you're probably wondering what we're even talking about. Well, simply put, VO2 max is the maximum amount of oxygen your body can use during intense exercise. Think of it as a measure of your aerobic fitness. The higher your VO2 max is, the more efficiently your body can use oxygen and generally, the better endurance you're going to have. It's important to keep in mind that VO2 max isn't everything though, because there are other factors that will affect performance, like your lactic threshold, which I also tested at that lab. Still though, VO2 max is a good way to establish your current fitness level and then trend it over time as you train. Now, when it comes to the results and what's good and what's bad is highly determined by you. Your gender and your age plays a huge role on your VO2 max. Typically, a male athlete will have a higher VO2 max than a female athlete. And on top of that, your VO2 max does decline as you age. So if you're a superior 60 year old male, that will look a lot different than a 20 year old male. The good news is there's lots of online resources to compare your VO2 max to the population and see where you stand, but that's not always important. It's really important just to see where you are now and where you could be in the future. Now, if you own a wearable device like a Garmin or Apple Watch, your estimated VO2 max is often displayed as milliliters of oxygen consumed per kilogram of body weight or ML slash KG slash MIN for short. And on wearable devices, your VO2 max estimation is often only updated when you do outdoor exercises like riding a bike or running because they use your GPS piece and your heart rate from those workouts to roll into the algorithm to give you your results. And of course, on top of that, because VO2 max is based on your weight, they also take your weight. So if your Garmin account has the incorrect weight in it, that will highly determine what your VO2 max is. So if you haven't yet, make sure to go into your wearable app of choice and update your weight because that is critically important. Now that we know what VO2 max is and how it works on your wearable of choice, how is this tested in a lab? Like I said, your watch is only estimating your VO2 max because it has no physical way to determine how much oxygen you're sucking in during a workout. And that's where a proper VO2 max lab test comes in. During my VO2 max lab test, I was put on a treadmill and I was wearing a big blue mask on my face. This mask was connected to a hose that fed into a super expensive machine that could determine exactly how much oxygen I was pulling in and how much carbon dioxide was coming out. During this test, I was told to run at a pretty casual pace to warm up for a few minutes. And then after that, the suffer fest ensued. The treadmill would increase its incline by 1% every one minute. It would continue to increase that incline indefinitely until failure. Basically, I would be increasing my intensity level at the same pace, boosting 
my heart rate, getting really worked up until I just couldn't do it anymore. And I gotta tell you, it is a humbling experience. Now, while I was suffering, that VO2 max machine I just talked about would be measuring my breaths and determining my ventilation threshold, essentially the point at which I couldn't breathe in enough oxygen to support the intensity that I was running at. And this would be my true VO2 max. Good push. I think I could hung out a little longer. <laughs> As for the results, after this test was complete, Human Powered Health did crunch all of the numbers and they were able to give me my true VO2 max score, which was 57 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight. Now, if we take that score and compare it to other athletes in my age group, that puts me in the upper spectrum of where I wanna be. So that's actually a pretty good score and I was really surprised by that, to be honest. Of course, that score can be better and I'm working on making it better, but that's for a whole different video. Now that we have my lab results of 57, let's move on to comparing that to all of the wearables to see how they compare. But before we get there, if you're finding this video fun or helpful, it would mean a lot to me if you went down and gave me a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel down below so you don't miss more videos from me in the future. And after you do that, also check check out the links in the description down below for all of the products I'll talk about this video and all of my social media accounts. I also wanna note that I do have full review videos for all of the things I'm talking about in this video. So if you wanna learn more about a particular thing, make sure to check out the channel and watch the full review. But for the sake of this video, we're only focused on VO2 max. Okay, now for the results. I'm going to work in order from least accurate to most accurate in my testing because this does get pretty interesting. And the first one I wanna talk about is unfortunately the Ultra Human Ring Air this tiny little thing I have here. The Ultra Human Ring Air is a really interesting device. As you can see, this is not a GPS watch at all. It is a tiny little smart ring with a heart rate sensor and all kinds of other sensors built into it. However, Ultra Human did add estimated VO2 max to their app in a recent firmware update. To be honest, I don't actually know what they're using to determine estimated VO2 max because this device does, does not have GPS built into it. They must be going on like resting heart rate, heart rate or something like that. I'll have to dig deeper in on that. Unfortunately though, the Ultra Human Ring Air did provide the least accurate results with a VO2 max estimated score of 44, which is considerably lower than my lab test. That is unfortunate because I really do like this device quite a bit. It's something I wear every day, and it is really good for tracking your sleep and activity throughout the day, but maybe not the best thing for VO2 max testing. With Ultra Human out of the way, the next one we need to talk about is Amazfit. For the purpose of testing, I used the Amazfit T-Rex 3 here, and they're a relatively new brand to the sport watch scene, but they've made a lot of headway due to their incredible build quality and pricing. Really affordable for what you get. They even offer the Amazfit Active 2 for 99 Bucks that does estimated VO2 max, which is really impressive for that price point. Unfortunately though, for whatever reason, from Amazfit, I always get a wildly inaccurate VO2 max. This has been the same case for years as I've tested these devices, and I'm still getting an estimated VO2 max of 48 which is not great. Again, I'm not sure how they come up with this metric and I'm not sure why it's so inaccurate because on some of these newer watches, their GPS and heart rate accuracy has gotten a lot better. So you'd think the VO2 max would too, but it must be something with their algorithm. Moving right along to Coros. This is the Coros Pace Pro and one of their newer watches, which is what I used for this testing. Coros does not put a big emphasis on VO2 max as they have their own performance metrics like their running fitness index. However, it's still there in the app, you just sort of have to dig for it behind the scenes a little bit. And within the Coros app, my current VO2 max after weeks of using this watch is 53, which is getting much closer to the lab test of 57, but still not quite there. Now that we've talked about Coros, this is a good segue into Garmin. So for the purpose of testing, I've been using the Garmin Phoenix 8 I have here and the Tactics 8 I'm wearing here. Garmin uses a technology called First Beat to determine your VO2 max. And they have a whole section on their website to explain how first beat works. The algorithm is based on your GPS pace and heart rate and other factors like your weight, your max heart rate and your zones. That all plays a role into the algorithm. What's interesting about Garmin though is that my VO2 max on Garmin has swayed drastically over time. About a year ago, I ran a big 100 mile endurance race and at that time it was telling me I had a VO2 max of 57. 
After that race, it seemed like every month it started to go down and down until it hit a low point of 50, and then it started to climb back up again. The good news is I am on the upward trend right now, according to Garmin, but still not quite in line with a lab test. As of today, my Garmin Connect account is reporting an estimated VO2 max of 53, right on the edge of 54, according to the graph, so it's closer, just not dead on accurate yet. It's within reach. Next up, let's talk Apple with the Apple Watch Series 10 and the Apple Watch Ultra 2 I have here. These are two of the watches from Apple I've been testing the most lately. When it comes to Apple Watches, it's sort of unique in that they sort of bury your estimated VO2 max behind a whole bunch of layers within the health app on your phone. Your VO2 max is not available at all on the watch itself. You need to enter the health app on your phone to get there. And even then you have to go into the browse menu and hit search and type in VO2 max to even find it. But it is there. When it comes to results on my Apple watches, my estimated VO2 max is currently at 55, which I think is a pretty good result considering margin of error and the fact that these are devices worn on my wrist. Uh, it's pretty close, respectable. Even though that's pretty close, it gets even better when we move on to Polar. This is the Polar Grit X2 Pro, which is the watch I've used for this testing purpose. And Polar watches have been around for a long time now and they approach VO2 max a bit differently than all these other brands. Instead of trending and averaging your VO2 max, they give you a unique VO2 max for every individual workout that's embedded on the summary page after your workout. Another difference here is that Polar does not call VO2 max VO2 max. They actually refer to it as running index, but it, it's still sort of the same thing. It's probably for liability reasons since it's an uh, estimation. So if we take a look at my last run with the Polar Grit X2 Pro, which was a zone two to three run, and check the running index score of that activity, you can see it gave me a value of 56. Now that's pretty darn close to my lab test and I'd say within margin of error. What's the percentage on that? Do the math. So yeah, good job Polar. That's a, that's a pretty solid result. But that's not the end of the story. It still gets a little better when we move to Suunto. This is the Suunto Race S. It's one of their more affordable options at $350 and the device I use for all of the testing in this video. When it comes to Suunto, they take a similar approach to Polar with VO2 Max. You get a new estimated VO2 Max score every time you run outside with a GPS turned on and the results are embedded into the Suunto app on your phone in the workout summary page. Looking at that same individual run I just talked about with Polar, Suunto gave me an estimated VO2 Max of 56.2, which just barely ekes out the Polar watches. I don't know if Polar rounds up or down or something like that, but this is the closest I've seen to my lab test from any of the watches I have here on the table. So a big kudos to Suunto. Now that we've gone through all the results from all these different watches, what does it all mean? Well, estimated VO2 max on your watch is just that estimated. The accuracy you're going to get can be swayed due to lots of variables. For example, if you're getting bad heart rate data from the optical sensor, your weight is entered incorrectly into the app of choice, your results is they're not going to be accurate. It's sort of going to be one of those garbage in garbage out situations. You need to get good data in to get good data out. Another thing to consider is that my results can be different than yours. We're all built differently. We have different running mechanics and different heart rate zones. So just because for the purpose of this this video, Suunto was the best in my experience so far when it comes to VO2 max accuracy, doesn't mean that's gonna be the case for you or even for me a year from now if, if anything changes with my physiology. So when it comes to estimated VO2 max on your wearable device, I wouldn't get too hung up on it. Don't get too concerned if you see it dropping like a rock or too excited if you see it going through the roof. If you're serious enough to care about this metric, I suggest going to a proper lab test like I did at Human Part Health and get super insightful information about all of your fitness with your lactic threshold and your VO2 max and your running gait and, and all the other things. By the way, if you want to learn more about the testing process and all the things I did at Human Powered Health, I have a whole separate video on this YouTube channel that you can go watch and see the whole process and how it works and all the data I got from it. Now, if you're not serious and you're everybody else out there, the estimated VO2 max metric on your watch is still a useful tool to see how you're improving over time. Even if the values aren't perfectly accurate, you should 
should still see your trend line going up over time. The fitter you get, the more training you do, the higher your cardio goes. Oh yeah, and there's one more device I wanted to mention in this video that I wasn't able to include, and that is the Whoop band I have here. They recently added estimated view to max to the Whoop app on your phone. Unfortunately, you have to wear this thing for 14 days before it gets unlocked, which I'm still in the process of doing. I'm on day like nine right now. I am curious to see how this compares to the lab test and all these other different devices. And maybe I'll do that in a future video. Would you be interested in that? Let me know in the comments down below. With that, we've reached the end of this video. And now I wanna hear from you in the comments down below. Have you done a proper VO2 max lab test? How did you compare to your wearable device? What did you find to be the most accurate? What did you learn from it? Let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to hear from you. And as always, after you're done commenting, also check out the links in the description down below where you can pick up any of the devices I talked about in this video. There's affiliate links down there. They do help support this channel, but they don't cost nothing extra to you. And after you're done shopping down there, also check out the other links to my other social media accounts like my Instagram, my threads, my Strava, and of course, check out my new podcast called Distance Junkie, available on Apple and Spotify and this very YouTube channel while you're at it. And that's it for this one. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll uh, see you in the next one. Bye.